question is, is healing for me? Yes. Have a good day. <laughs> Thanks for coming. See you next Sunday. Okay, we're going to get a little bit more in depth. Okay, so you hear my voice, all right? Do Christians get sick? They can. That was like on cue. They can. Because why? Because we live in this world. That's why. Maybe we didn't rest enough. I don't know why. But we do sometimes. Sometimes it happens. But today we're going to learn, because this is what everybody's did, 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 talking about, we're going to learn how to silence that and settle for sure for you, for me. Because I am settled that I am healed, whether my voice agrees or not. The, my voice is not stronger than the Bible. The promises that I have in the Bible are sure. Why? Because the things that we see are temporal, but the things that are unseen or eternal. And I will choose to believe the Bible over a thermometer every day. Now, for clarity, I am not contagious. I did go to the doctor. Yes, a pastor went to a doctor. Yes, she does. I went to the doctor. I was diagnosed with laryngitis, which is not contagious, and they gave me some medicine for. However, the rest of my family who's not here is, so they are at home <laughs> in their own little cocoon. So, but what does it look like when a Christian gets sick, what should you do? What should you do? Should you throw your hands up and be like, well, clearly this does not work? No, you should not. I'm going to equip you today and hang on, okay? Because here's the deal. It does not matter my opinion. It does not matter your opinion. It does not matter the doctor's opinion. What matters is the word. So the word is what's going to change things. So what am I going to do? I'm going to throw a lot of word at you. But guess what? You have a very big catcher's mitt. And so you can hold on to the word. Because I know you can. Okay? Hang on. It is such a good ride. You are not going to even believe. So what we are is we are a training ground. We are a training ground not just to get goosebumps on Sunday morning and feel great about ourselves and be like, Ooh, I went to church, get my check mark. We're excited. That is not what we are to do. We are here to equip you to go outside those doors. And when you go outside those doors and you go to your work, to your home, to your school, to wherever it is that you go, you are equipped to know what to do in that situation. And so today, this is what we're doing because when the world is talking about death and destruction, and did you know sickness is part of that? So sickness was not God's idea, okay? Death was never even God's idea. But sickness is tied to death. Think about it. When your body gets sick, and then you get to be inactive, and once you are inactive, and then you start to deteriorate, and when you deteriorate eventually, like eventually, not today, but eventually, that's leading you into your grave. Well, this, we want no parts of sickness because it is part of what we are redeemed from. We're redeemed from the curse. And so we want no parts of it. So when it happens, this is what we're going to do. Did you know that Jesus talked about sickness and healing, healing, more than he talked about hell when he was here on earth? Shocking, right? Because you would think one of his main things that he was doing here was he was redeeming us from hell, right? Eternal damnation. So you think you talk about that. That'd be like top of the list. But no, he talked about sickness more. Why? Why? Well, let me tell you. Because when somebody is sick and then they are healed, then they want to know why that happened. And so that was used a ton in Jesus' ministry about, hey, are you sick? Come, let's get healing. And they were, many were instantly healed. Not all were instantly healed, but all who came wanting healing, ready to receive their healing, were healed. The only times the people were not healed when Jesus walked here on earth was because of unbelief. Or That's the only time. Religion will stop healing. Religion will stop the blessings from flowing in your life. Now, religion, what I'm talking about is a list of rules and regulations that you can and cannot do to be a friend of God. Hey, are you saved? Did you, did you invite Jesus into your life? You are now a friend of God. You now qualify. Not based on what you do, based on what he already did for you. So religion is this little thumb that tries to keep you down and says, but if you follow the 10, then you get these benefits. Or it says, if you go to church every week and don't forget to tithe, then you are opening yourself up to all these blessings. Is it true that you should do those things? Absolutely. But the reason why is not so that you qualify. The reason why you do these things is so that you know who you are in Christ. It's not so that he can say, Kim attended church this Sunday. Check 
she will receive her healing at 2.05 this afternoon. Oh, no, let's make it one because there is a Steeler game, and you know how she likes to cheer for the Steelers, which is not true. I'll be asleep. So, I mean, Steelers are fine. Sorry. That was like a hush fell over the crowd. Like, don't be talking. You can talk about religion, Kim, but do not be talking bad about the Steelers. I'm not talking bad about the Steelers. I lived here longer than I've lived anywhere in my life. So, go Steelers. All right. Healing is as much a part of salvation as being saved from hell, which is what we're talking about today. The last thing Jesus said before he left this earth, don't you think that's important? Yes, I do. Have I taught this part of it before? Yeah, I have. Why am I teaching it today? Because you need it and so do I. Okay? So before he left this earth, the last things that he said were this. And he said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, number one. They will speak with new tongues, number two. They will take up serpents, number three. If they drink any deadly, anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them, number four. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That is five, that is the number of grace, and then he checked out shortly thereafter. He's talking about this is what happens. This is what I have purchased for you. This is what you can now do. Now do it. All those things happened and were available to us after the cross which means they're available to us today so why do I sound like this because we live in a lost and dying world we live in a fallen world and guess what do you want to know why so this was revelation this is not even in my notes this was revelation to me I said it on Thursday nights this is why you need to come to Bible study you have no idea what comes out so on Thursday night I said this because I I'm going to a job that it takes me like 45 minutes to get to. So I get a lot of prayer time, right? And so one of the things that I've been praying is, which I pray all the time, you know, pray without ceasing, but I specifically have this prayer time to do some like confessions and to talk to God. And it's like my time and his until somebody calls me. And so I have been praying specifically that the Holy Spirit think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords, okay? Creffle Dollar says it all the time. And I thought he said it for like the entire time I've listened to him. And so for some reason, I'm like, yeah, I want that. And so then when I couldn't talk, because let me tell you, this is a voice compared to what I had. I had none. I was whispering like this. It was crazy because my whole house was quiet. I have a teenage son and a husband. Even the dogs were quiet because I was whispering, so, so were they. It was hysterical. I think I might try it again. But anyway, I was on the way to work praying the same thing with no voice. And I get to the part that says, and speak through my vocal cords. And I'm like, oh, now I know why the attack happened. Because see, that's what's happening. What's happening when I go out is people are drawn to me and they are to you too. Look around, look up because they are. Because it's not just me because I'm special. I am, but so are you. The love of Jesus that's in you is drawing people. Especially now, because that darkness is dark and you are super light. And so when you are walking through the darkness and people are coming to you and then they need something and you cannot physically speak, that's a problem. Because I don't know sign language. And I'm like, oh, this is why. I understand. I said speak through my vocal cords and then I lost my voice for like two weeks. Then I got it back a little bit, and then I came, to, I came to Bible study on Thursday, and I sounded mm, maybe a little bit worse than what I do right now. And so all the really awesome prayer warriors laid hands on me and prayed for me on Thursday night, and I woke up on Friday morning, and I had zero voice. Zero. Like, now, does that mean that the Word of God is not true? No. Does that mean that I shouldn't have had hands laid on me? No. Does it mean that, what does it mean? Nothing. Because, see, I still have the word of God that says my healing was brought 2,000 years ago, whether I had a voice or not. But I woke up that morning. Seriously, the specific prayer was is that when Kim wakes up on, the, on Friday morning that she her voice is full and strong. And it was zero. Like nothing. What in the world? So here's what I did, and here's what you can do too. Because it works. Because here's the thing. We are not finished yet. 
Because two weeks ago, this started, and it's still like lingering a little bit now, means nothing. And guess what? Since you still have a symptom, means nothing. And guess what? Since you still have a pain when you get up, and oh, when it rains, my sciatica hurts, means nothing because we still have the word of God on the situation. And if you'll align your heart and your mouth, then it happens so much more quickly. Because see, the will of God does not just happen in life. Why am I talking about this? I don't know, but I'm going to tell you this. The will of God does not just happen. It doesn't. So many people just blame whatever happens in the world on, well, it must have been God's will because God is sovereign. Yes, he is, but he's sovereign to his word. And so when you have, <coughs> excuse me, something that has happened to you, it does not necessarily mean it came from God. Did my sickness come from God? No, it did not. Did it come to teach me something? No. I'm going to show you today why it did not. So we have to use our mouths to speak what it is that God said about us and not what the world said about us. Because let me tell you this, I could have hung on to, maybe I have COVID. Now I'll tell you, I did COVID tests because that was a responsible thing to do because I was going to chaperone a bunch of kids. I could have hung on to, well, it's that time of year, you know, I always get bronchitis and I'd be in the bed today. But that's not what we did. I'm going to show you what I did. So, God used the healings that Jesus did when he was here on earth to confirm who Jesus was to the people that were there. So why would it be any different for you? I have had people that have called to ask me for healing. Actually, they text to ask me to pray for healing. They did not know I sounded like so much worse than this. And I did it anyway because just because I had sickness, did not, I had a, 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 an evidence of sickness, a symptom of sickness, did not mean that God's word wasn't true. So I prayed for them anyway. And guess what? They got healed and I still couldn't talk. What? Does it make the word of God less true? No, it does not. No, it does not. It is completely secondary. This is what the early church, this is what they did in the early church. It says that they went out, they preached everywhere, the Lord, Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. This is for us today. Heal the sick, raise the dead, speak in new tongues, cast out demons, all the stuff we just talked about, that is for us even still today. That did not pass away with Jesus. Did you know that 85% of the people in the U.S. believe that there is a God and only 10 to 15% of them go to church? Why? I'll tell you why. I know. Ooh, pick me, pick me. Here's why. It's because they don't think that God is relevant to them. We have to make it relevant to them. How? By telling them that who they are is enough right now. That when they ask Jesus into their lives, it means so much more than just fire insurance from hell. And that living with God is way better than living without God. And that guess what? When you're sick, when you're anxious, when you're depressed, when all these things are happening on you and to you, you, can't, you don't just have to lay there and take it. That there's a God who loves you and wants you so much better than that. And he doesn't want to leave you where you are, but wants to take you and throw his love on you and have a revelation of his love in you. And so that can shine through you to that lost and dying world. And those people, when they look into the mirror and they're like, you know what? I don't know. I don't feel very good. Hmm, maybe I'll ask, uh, you know, Pastor Mary to pray for me. I don't know. And she does and it happens. And guess what? That's like the dinner bell for the unsaved. They're like, wait, maybe there's something to this. Maybe there's something to this. I don't know. This is what it's for. This is why it's important. They need God in life, not just in death. Okay, so Galatians 1, 3 through 4, it says, Grace to you and peace from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Yeah, thank you, Lord. That is relevant for today. Don't let anybody tell you the Bible is not true for today, because it is. According to the will of our God, and Father. That's a key right there. According to the will of God, if you do not know what his word says and you think that he wants you to be sick, broken, disgusted all the time, then you won't expect anymore. If you think that sickness is part of bearing a cross for God, if you think that being poor is helping God, and if you think that makes you holy and noble, then you'll stay that way. Now, You'll still go to heaven. I'm not saying that you're going to go to hell for that. But you're going to live not as you should here on earth. Because you can live far and above that. You don't have to stay there. This salvation that we're talking from, talking about is from the word, the, the, the root word sozo, S-O-Z-O. 
and it is a Greek word that is used over 100 times in the New Testament. So I think it's probably pretty important, don't you? If, you're, if God is inspiring people to write this word over 100 times in the New Testament, we should pay attention. That means saved, healed, delivered from demons, to be made whole, and to be raised from the dead. Doesn't that sound like what we just now talked about? What Jesus said to do before we left, before he left? Sozo, right? Now let's look at how it's translated. Let's look in the Bible and see how it's been translated through the Bible. Because sometimes when you translate stuff, it is, people translate with their own biases and conceptions, right? And what their revelation is at the time. So we need to sometimes go back to the original and see what is it that he was talking about. When it came straight from the Holy Spirit, before you were trying to translate it into English, what were we talking about? So we're doing a little bit of that today. We're not going to do the whole Bible. Matthew 121 says, And she shall bring forth, this is talking about the birth of Jesus, she will bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So we see that salvation is saving people from their sins. That is how, but this is that word sozo. I want you to see how it's used in different places and translated in different places. But it's the same word. This one is talking about salvation. Do you remember the madman the mad of Gadara? This is a story. It says they went out to see what was done because now the man has been healed. And they came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid because this is the guy that they had put on the island and said, hey, we're going to put you in the tombs. And they tried to chain him because he was so crazy. And he broke the chains because demons are strong. Okay, they also, which saw it, told by what means that he was possessed of the devil. So they were telling you about how bad he was. But now he sat there healed. Salvation, healing, demon possession, gone. That same word, that same word that happened when you invited Jesus into your heart to live. That same word is what they're talking about right here. How about J. Iris' daughter? It talks about, but when Jesus heard it, he answered to him saying, this is when Jesus heard about the daughter dying because he was supposed to go heal her. And then he was delayed. And then she died. Let's talk about bad timing. Like, oops, I almost missed, I missed it. Oh, well, now she's dead. That's not what Jesus said. He said before the dad could even say anything, which was smart. Jesus was smart. Before the dad could cry a tear, say a word of negativity, he said, fear not, believe only. She shall be made whole. That's raised from the dead, people. That's the same thing that's living on the inside of you at the moment of salvation. At that moment. We just need revelation of it. That's what going to church is about. That's what reading your Bible is about. That's what listening to grace preachers is about. To hear what it is that, you're, that, to hear what it is that has already been given to you. Healing and forgiveness are linked together. I'm going to tell you, this is quick. Okay, I'm going to tell you it's 10 points. You got it, okay? I talk fast. It's good. Okay, so point number one, healing and forgiveness are linked together. This is what you need to remember when you wake up and you maybe have no voice or you have 102 temperature or you're up with your sick kid all night. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless not the Lord. Bless, no, do bless the Lord. Oh, good grief. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, not just salvation from hell, who forgives your iniquities and heals your diseases. Even in the Old Testament, when they're talking about the salvation of the Lord, they put them together. Heals your sickness and saves you. That's what they're talking about. Healing and forgiveness are linked together. Now, I just want to ask this. Do not answer, because you may be embarrassed if you answer it wrong, and I don't want to do that to you. Don't you think it's funny that we believe that God can heal you, can save you from eternity in hell, even though we were born sinners, okay? We were born with the sin nature. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, now that sin nature has been taken away and we're replaced with his righteousness. However, don't you think it's funny that we wrap our heads around that, but then we think healing is optional? Healing is an add-on? Like, he can save you for an eternity in hell, burning with the devil and his demons, but... A head cold? I don't know. Cancer? I don't know. Arthritis? I don't know. Maybe. That's, that's not smart. 
If he can do a 10, then it kind of makes sense that he could also do a five. Because which is harder? To save somebody from sin, to save somebody from hell, or to heal somebody? Well, it's harder. Like, to save someone from hell, nobody could do it. Healing was even part of the Old Testament, right? But, but saving from hell was not part of the Old Testament in the way that we are today, post-cross. So why? It doesn't make sense, but we've been taught so differently. Because why? Because people are sick all the time. And we want to blame Jesus. We want to blame God. We want to blame ourselves. And it's none of those things. It's the devil. Newsflash. It's the devil. This is not part of our over and abundant life. This is not part of living in victory when you won't feel good. It connects you to death. Get rid of it. I'm telling you how today. Yes, with my cracky voice, I hear it too. I tell you what, I don't care if I have to whisper. I'm going to finish it. It matters not to me. It matters not to me. my assignment today. So, number two. Oh, well, we're going to talk about number two of this. So, Scripture does not separate, separate sickness, healing, and salvation. He who bore our sins in his own body on a tree that we, having died to sins, might be righteousness, and by whose stripes you were healed. Together. Together. First Peter 2.24. That's like super duper um, like healing scripture. Everybody knows that. Isaiah 53.5. First Peter 2.24. If you know nothing else about healing, you probably know those. They're together. Right? Yes, they are. Scripture does not separate them. It is a package deal. It is not an add-on at checkout. It is not what you also like fries with your meal. It is the whole meal. Okay? We don't need to separate them anymore. Are you going to hell? No. If you have Jesus in your heart? No, you're not. Do you need to be sick? No. Okay. Jesus never has put sickness on us. 17 times in the gospel, Jesus healed everybody who was there. Uh, just in the four gospels. Another 47 times, he healed one or two people at a time. As I said before, the only time he didn't was why? Religion, unbelief, and being mad. That's why, that's why healing did not work around Jesus. His answer was always yes. God did not put sickness on people to teach them something. Then we need to find out how does he teach if that's not true. Okay, if you've read the Old Testament, you know that what I just said sounds wrong. Okay, because in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, pre-cross, curses did come on people. But sickness was always part of the curse. Sickness was never once considered a blessing. God did, I mean, it says it pretty clear in the Bible, that in the, under the Old Covenant, it was a different time, and that sickness was on God's people as a curse, never as a blessing. Now, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So that is no longer applicable to us. That is not part of a blessing that is ours. That is a part of the curse that was taken care of over 2,000 years ago. So that is, so let's settle that. So let's see, how does God train his people now? If you're not going to train somebody with sickness or disease, then how are you going to train somebody? Oh, I'm so glad you asked because it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So is he trying to teach you something by putting sick, sickness on you? No. Oh, right. See, you were listening. No. How does he correct you now? How does he now teach us? Through scripture. It says it multiple places, but I'm only going to use one today. This is what sickness is not here to teach you. The Bible is not, is very clear about, on that. Now, I had a friend who was in a car accident, and she swore that the car accident was created so that people could see how well she walked through being sick and being hurt by this car accident. Until the day she died, she never got healing. She never believed it was hers. She believed that her purpose in life was hurt. <coughs> pardon me, by God so that people could learn about how she still loved God in spite of what he did to her. What? We went round and round about this. Because see, 
That's an abusive Heavenly Father. Don't do that. Don't serve an abusive Heavenly Father. You would go to jail if you did that to somebody here on earth. But we say that God did this to us to teach us something or to have this happen so that other, he's going to sacrifice you so that others can see how good he is. Boy, he must not think much about you. He must not think much about you. Mm, I got it all out. That would be so terrible. So then that means that he loves you more than he loves me, and he'll let me sit in my mess so that you can be better. Doesn't that feel wrong? Anyone else? Yeah. It feels icky. If it doesn't feel right, go to the Word. Go to the New Testament. Find out what God is talking to about. Because that is not part of him. But see, we do this as our, this is our catch-all phrase, Romans 8, 28, but all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. So clearly he caused this accident so that way he could be glorified. No, he can cause things that happen to work for your good, but he does not cause all things to happen. Okay? If so, he would be responsible for babies that were killed, for old people that are abused, for the hurt that happened in your life, for maybe the things that didn't happen well for you when you were growing up. And he would be responsible for that. And he would be saying, you know what? Kim, that's me, can grow up in what is practically the flipping Brady Bunch childhood. I had a great life. I had a great childhood. I did. Two loving parents, same home. We had money. My story is pretty boring. But yet, you sit over here in poverty and being abused. Well, he must love Kim more. Well, that doesn't even make sense. Because he has, he's no respecter of persons. So that does not make sense. So he is not going to put on you something that he is not going to do for one that he's not going to do for another. Why did that happen to you? Because your parents probably, did, maybe they did not do what they were supposed to be doing and they were the ones in authority over you. But God is able to make things that happen still work for your benefit. He did not cause them all, but they can work for your benefit. But this is what we teach people because we can't explain what happens in life. So we just put it under, well, we don't understand. We'll understand once we get to heaven. Yes, there are things I don't understand about the Bible. I'm going to admit that fully. But this isn't one of them. I know where sickness lies, and that's under the curse. So what is the real life application? The doctor gives you a diagnosis. You find a lump, you find a bump, you find a scrape, you find a bruise, you whatever it is. First of all, we're going to resist the devil. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The Bible never says once, have, the God, have God resist the devil for you. He already did that. The battle's already won. But if you act like a doormat, he will take over. If you just take it and be like, oh, I'm sick. Now, like... What are people afraid of? COVID, cancer, whatever. Insert your problem here. Oh, now I have COVID. I guess I'm probably just going to be one of the people that die from it. You don't have to be that. That's not resisting the devil. What's resisting the devil is saying, oh, I am healed because Jesus said I'm healed. I don't care what the COVID test said. I don't care what it is that that report said. I don't care what the oncologist said. My hope is in the Lord. That is a symptom and that is temporary. And that is not something that we need to be concerned about. And then your focus is no longer on the sickness, but on the healer. And this is how it works. This has worked. This has worked. We, we got to go to the word. In one of the villages, Jesus met a man with, the advanced case, with an advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, he bowed his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out to him, touched him, and said, I'm willing. He said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. If you do not know what the Bible says about healing, then you will walk around being sick. This is why we run to the word when we have a problem. It's because faith cannot happen until the will of God is known. If you don't know if healing is for you, then you cannot have faith for healing. You cannot connect to what the Bible says and to what Jesus paid for if you don't know that it's for you. If you, th if you think that, the that sickness is for you, then you're going to be sick. And you're going to stay sick. But I'm telling you today how to get out of it. You have to know what the Bible says. And the Bible says you are were healed over 2,000 years ago. So what we're going to do is we're going to rest in the finished work. It says, truly my soul finds rest in God. 
my salvation from, from, saved from what? Saved from hell, saved from demons, saved from, saved from sickness. It comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. This is, this is why we have to know the word right here. He is my rock. I will not be shaken. Regardless of what happens in my body, I will not be shaken. We have to believe in God's love for us. It says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. A loving father does not treat his children poorly, and he does not put sickness and disease on them. He, he just doesn't, and he loves you. Why? Because you're so good? Okay. Yes and no. We used to be sinners. We are now saved by grace. Now when he looks at you, he sees his son. He does not see your mistakes. He does not see what you did wrong. He does not see that you didn't come to church last week. I didn't either, by the way. He does not see all those mistakes that you made. He sees a perfect specimen of deserving of his love. That's what he sees. And when you see that God sees you like that, not based on your works, not based on what you said to your spouse walking into the church, then you can receive that love. Because it's not based on you. You have to be supply-minded, not demand-focused. You have to be, faith is the hand that takes from God. It's not like faith is something that you have to really muster up to say, if I have enough faith, then he might do this for me. No, it is, I am loved. He already did it. It is mine. Now, Lord, thank you. Just like a toddler, imagine yourself like a little kid. It's mine. It's mine. It wasn't your idea. It's not being selfish. It was never your idea to begin with. It was his idea. This, these things were bought before you were ever on this earth. And they weren't your idea. They were his. They were provisioned that he put here for you for when you needed it. And we need it. Some of us today more than others. Communion. This is talking about communion. It says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. This is talking about the old covenant, the old testament. That what they knew at the time did not work for them fully. Now this is the new. Anyone who eats bread from heaven, however, will never die. Because we have everlasting life, even after our bodies are no longer here. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer... So the world may live is my flesh. This is clearly talking about communion. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I live because of the living father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of their works. No. We'll live why? Why? Because your focus when you take communion needs to be on him. That's, why, that's one of the reasons why we partake of communion is to have our focus off of when I am ingesting the bread and the grape juice. That is what we use here. When I'm ingesting that, I am seeing on what happened but that he bore my sickness and disease on his back and he paid the price for laryngitis, for whatever it is. And I'm picturing that in my mind's eye. And I'm reminding myself of it. It's not like if you do it so many times and God's going to see you as good enough and going to heal you. We cannot make these things that are available to us work because we're now doing them out of religion. We have to do them out of revelation. I get to partake of communion every day. I do it at my house. I do it more when I'm sick. Why? Because I need to be reminded Next to the tissues, next to the Vicks Vapo Rub, I got my communion, and I got my crackers, I got my juice, and I got my Bible, and I got my anointing oil. I'm up here today. This is how we live. This is how we remain in Him. Jesus said it very plainly. Plainly. Now, here's the deal. I don't know about you, but when I get sick, especially when I have a fever, I get crazy, like nutty. Like I'm not even like my normal self. I start crying for no reason. I don't know why. I, my head immediately goes to the worst thing that could happen. It's like I wasn't even saved. I don't know why, but I gotta stop it, okay? Cause I am saved and I have got to like arrest the thought, right? So you gotta take every thought captive. It says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. So when I am feeling that I am sick in my body and I can see myself in my own grave, yes, I know, even over laryngitis, 
by myself, I'm a huge hot mess. This is why I need Jesus. So, and bringing, but this is, I don't stay there. Like, it does happen, like, real quick. And then I'm like, come on, pastor, get it together. And then bringing every captive, and, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How do you do that? That's the anointing. That's how you do it. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You cannot capture a thought with a thought. If I sit there, quiet, and let my head run, it will not go anywhere I want to follow. It will only go places that are deep and dark and horrible. How do you capture a thought? With a word. You have to speak. You have to read. You have to speak. Because you cannot continue to think of things while your mouth is saying something else. It's impossible. So when you're like, oh, these bad thoughts keep coming. I keep thinking about blah, 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 blah. Especially anxiety. Oh, my gosh, that one's a hard one, right? <laughs> yes and no. It's hard because it's constantly there. But it is constantly there. And what you've got to do is open this based on what's gone in here and gone in here and open your mouth to combat what is the craziness that's going on in your head because if you sit there silent you will wake up dead it's not an option <laughs> you wake up and you wake up dead you'll wake up in heaven and you'll be like how did I get here and Jesus will be like well remember that remember that scripture Kim was talking about you didn't do that and now here you are but here's the thing it's fine when you go to heaven Great, wonderful, yay for you, terrible for us. Do you know that you have stuff here on earth that you were born for this time and you can, when you're in heaven, it does us no good. If you die, great for you. But now you've left without doing your calling, without accomplishing what you were called here to do. That is not okay. Do you know how old you are? Think about all you've been through. Think about what you're called to do, what you even know right now, because what you know right now is only a part. It's being revealed every day, right? And think about what other people would have to do to get caught up to where you are right now. We don't have that kind of time. We are living in the end times, people. You have to stay. 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 This is how you do it. Take every thought captive. Now, praise, super important. The 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. In Christ Jesus, for you, it does not say for everything give thanks. Do not, we're not thanking God for the bad things that happen. God was not part of that. In everything, find the thing that you can rejoice. Find the, this is why you need to know your Bible, because find out what he said about the outcome of your situation. The, the word rejoice there means to brighten up, to leap, and to spin around. Have you ever tried to be mad and dance? If anyone knows Seinfeld, it might look like the Elaine dance. You know the Elaine dance where she's like, <laughs> if you haven't watched Seinfeld because you're a sinner, not a sinner, then, well, you understand that reference. But I have I've watched Seinfeld a time or two. You is very difficult to be mad when you're dancing. So when you are in, this, in the midst of your trouble, this is, sounds so stupid. It really does. Even as I'm saying it, I'm getting embarrassed. But when you're doing it, when you're in the midst of trouble, I encourage you to speak good things, sing, why not? And why not just dance? I mean, like, this talks about spinning around. Have you ever seen someone in a bar acting like that, being sad? Oh, you haven't been to a bar. Maybe on TV you've seen it. Maybe you haven't. That's okay. Listen, some of these things just work, whether you're a sinner or a saint. It just works. Rejoice. Get yourself out of there. Don't let yourself stay, stay where you are. Okay, moving on. Be open to wisdom. That's the last time I'm dancing in this church, just so you know, unless it's in the spirit, and then you'll know. So get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget. Do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, wisdom. She will preserve you, wisdom. Love her will keep you wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom and in all you're getting get understanding and sometimes when you are praying for healing it will happen immediately and those times are fantastic 
Sometimes you're like, I'm sick. I know I need to have hands laid on me. And it happens like that. And you walk out and you're well. That's fantastic when that happens, right? It's happened to me before. It doesn't always happen like that. What has happened to me and to other people is you will sometimes receive wisdom about what to do in your situation for the sickness that you're experiencing. Maybe God wants you to cut out caffeine and he just leads you gently to say, it's time to like, you know, 10 cups of coffee by 10 a.m. is not a goal, honey. We need to calm it down a little bit and maybe that little arrhythmia will calm down a smidge. Maybe he's telling you, go walk around the block. Maybe he's saying, you know what, you don't need to be on sugar anymore. Maybe he's saying, you know what, let's add selenium to your, to your things. Whatever it is. These are the parts of wisdom that when you have the natural and the supernatural that are working together. Could God heal you like that? Yes. Did he already heal you like that over 2,000 years ago? Yes. Why sometimes now do we need to have something that is here to help us? Why? I don't know. But sometimes that's how it works. Sometimes he is leading us to, because here's the deal. The end result is healing, right? How do you get there? It doesn't even matter. How you get there is no less important if you took, I don't know why I keep saying selenium, selenium to do it. It's no less real if you took, if you prayed to God and God led you to take a probiotic and you feel better. It's still healing. I've told the story about my kid that was diagnosed with autism and then we did we prayed, and we prayed for wisdom, and we, we bought supplements based on what God told us to do. And the kid is no longer autistic. No one believes that story because it doesn't happen in the world. But it happened to me. It happened to that kid. Why? Because we followed what God said. And it wasn't just pray, Jesus, 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 every moment. It was, I think I'm supposed to go here and do that. And we went there and did that. And then that worked. So do, open yourself up to wisdom. Open yourself up to what God has for you in whatever package it is that he brings it to you. Do not fear. Fear will stop it. We don't need to fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. We always focus on the fear. Now you got to get rid of the fear. But let's look at the second part of that scripture. The second part of that scripture says, he has given us a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. You know, when I go crazy, when I get sick, this is my scripture. Because I need a sound mind. And I need to feel powerful because I am because of who resides inside of me. And I do feel love because of why? Because he is love living on the inside of me. And so I go to, he's not giving us a spirit of fear because fear will take you, your head down that road to death. But when you have power and love and a sound mind and that's what you're declaring over your life, then that is the road that you're going to go after. Don't fear. It's not cute and it's not funny. People think it's hysterical. People make jokes about it all the time. Have you, have you heard people? Have you talked to anybody lately? Oh, I guess this is going to happen to me now. My mama died at 54. I guess I'm dying at 54. <laughs> That's not funny. That's terrible. Why are you laughing? What's wrong with you? Oh, yeah. At, at this age, my, this, my uncle, no, none of the men in my family have lasted after 60, 66 years old. They all die by then. I guess I got only 10 years left. You can don't say stuff like that in front of me because I will call you out on it like right away. Like, well, I guess you will. Would you like to maybe live just a couple more years? Because see, we are guaranteed a long life here if you want it. We could take care of that like today. Let me show you how. Because that stuff irritates me. Because when you just have it in your regular life and your regular vocabulary, and that's what you're saying, guess what's gonna happen? Shocking what you say is what's going to happen. Is this sickness for me? Is that confession for me? I have, like, I am, I'm very, I'm, I'm super simple, okay? John 10, 10. The thief does not come except to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I came that you would have life and have it more abundantly. Is sickness life and life more abundantly? So where's it from? The devil. Is it from God? No. Why? If you only remember one scripture, John 10, 10. It's even like, 
if you can remember the Ten Commandments. Ten, ten. Okay, John, the book of love. Ten, ten. The thief comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. I came that you would have life and life more abundantly. Is anxiety from Jesus? No. Is sickness from Jesus? No. What is abundant life? Power, love, a sound, healed, hold, whole, ready to go out and conquer the world. Because why? Because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what he paid the price for. He paid a huge price to buy where we are supposed to live. Have you, in the Bible, it even talks about what it was going to look like when he was paying the price for your healing, paying the price for your sin, for my sin. And it says in Isaiah 52, 14, it says, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly even human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he's a man. That's how much he loved us. That's how much he loved you. He put himself through that, even though he had not sinned at all. He took all the sins, all the sickness, all the COVID, all the cancer, all the laryngitis, all the fevers, all the anxiety, all the bipolar, took it on him so that you don't have to live with it. It's not, does not make you holy to live with something that was already paid for. It does not keep you out of heaven. This is not condemning. I'm not saying that you have to be well to work for God. You hear me. I'm saying that don't let it be the, the, the determining factor. I'm saying pay attention to what it was that he already did for you. And when you know that, then walk in that. And even when it is a gradual process, it had started before you ever got sick. When you latch on to what you know because the Bible told you, that's when that connection is made. And regardless of what you see or what you feel, that healing has already taken place. And then you walk it out. And if it happens gradually, then it happens gradually. Who cares? It's still happening. It doesn't always happen instantaneously, but that does not mean that it's any less real. It does not mean the only time it's going to stop, the only time you're going to stop getting better is when you stop it. How are you going to stop it? With your mouth. With what your thoughts are taking you down. Once you know what is yours and you claim what is yours because Jesus bought it for you and you, you say, in my body, I accept nothing less than 100% healed and whole from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And that any germ or any sickness or any disease is trespassing on the Lord's property. And then I have Jesus' blood that flows through my veins and everything must line up. The only thing that's going to stop the healing from manifesting is you. Don't. Don't. You know better today. You know how to do it. If you only know this sermon and you know nothing else, you know how to do it after today. If you sit there and you start feeling sorry for yourself, because why did this happen to me? Because why, why am I sick and this other person who was exactly in the same place isn't sick? Wonder, why is it me? Why does this stuff always happen to me? Why is it always my family? You're sunk. You're sunk. Like, for real. It's a matter of time. You need to watch what you say. The Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. The chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. And the stripes, which is actually mistranslated, it is stripe singular because his entire back was gone. The stripe that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. You can be pitiful or you can be powerful, but you cannot be both. He made it so that you could be powerful because of him. 
He made it that you don't have to live in sickness and disease, no matter what it is, from a cold to cancer or to whatever it is. And it's up to you how much of that you want to take. But it is there for the taking. It is on the table. And all you have to do is pick it up and say, thank you, Jesus, that you did this for me. And then don't put it back down. You know, all the 10 steps that I went through, all the scriptures that I went through, that's the thing that you need to remember. Salvation and healing are in the same exact word. It was his plan from the beginning. It is the thing that disconnects you from death. And sickness is part of death. Just continue to stay disconnected from it. Don't accept it in your life anymore because, because of what he already did for you. You have to stand up and say what you're willing to accept. And you do that every day. When you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you decide what kind of day you're going to have. And you decide what you're going to do today with your thoughts. You decide what you're going to do today with your mouth. And I'm encouraging you. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Choose life so that you and your seed may live. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for a powerful revelation of who you are today. Lord, I thank you for taking what we could not take, for doing what we could not do, even if we were willing to go to a cross, even if we were willing to accept the stripes on our back, even if we were willing to do that, it wouldn't have been enough. But we thank you for going and doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. And today, we confess that we accept it, we receive it with a grateful heart. We receive what you have done for us wholly and fully. And right now, I pray for those that are experiencing some symptoms in their body. I declare healing from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Anxiety, you must go. Sickness, you are evicted. Headaches, you need to leave. You are not welcome here. Satan, you take your hands off of God's people. This is not your property anymore. We declare from this moment on that healing that was paid for by Jesus flows through us and in us and out of us. The things that we walked in here with, we don't walk out of here with. What we walk out with is a revelation of who we are in you. We walk out of the fact that it is us who you empower to lay hands on the sick so that they will recover because of the power that you are constantly supplying and giving us. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you that this was not our idea, this was yours. We thank you that you loved us so much that you provided these things for us. We thank you that you are a good heavenly father that has only good things for his kids. And we receive them. We receive them through faith, faith believing that that is what you want for us. Faith believing that you have made us worthy. You have made us a holy receptacle for those gifts and for those callings. And as we go through this week, when we walk out of here today and we feel great and wonderful and high on top of the world, and as we go through this week, if those lying symptoms try to come back, remind us at this moment that healing has already occurred, that it is, sickness is no longer ours to deal with, that pain is no longer ours, that it doesn't matter what we see. It matters who you are. And help us to stand on that in those times because you are there to comfort and to be with us and to strengthen us and to give us power and our love and a sound mind. And we, were, we claim that for us now and later as well. In Jesus' precious name, amen.